Due to the limited monetization of true crime videos on YouTube, I have created a Patreon for those of you who would like to support the channel. The link is in the description below. Get access to ad-free content, early access, and exclusive videos depending on the tier. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of this content. It really helps out the channel. Hello, and welcome back to another interrogation breakdown. Today we will be covering the interrogation of Mark Hacking in collaboration with Wes Most, who obtained the interrogation footage. Mark Hacking reported his wife, Lori, missing on July 19, 2004, after calling her work and being told she had never arrived that morning. Mark says his wife went for her morning run around 5 a.m. and never returned home. He said he was supposed to drive her to work by 7, but when he woke up at 8, she had not awoken him, but her car was gone, so he assumed she had driven herself to work and let him sleep. At 9 a.m., he says he left his house and bought a mattress the couple had been searching for. He brought it home, and that's when he called Lori's work phone. At the realization that Lori was missing, Mark and her co-workers called 911, reported her as a missing person. Everyone went to the area where Lori runs in the mornings and saw her car was parked there. The police get the statement from Mark and her co-workers and immediately start a search for Lori. This interview is the same day that Lori has been reported missing. If you want the conclusion to what happened, skip forward to the chapter that says conclusion now. Alright, let's dive in. I haven't been involved with the case very much. I've been over at the DA's office all day. Okay. They just sent me up there just a little bit before you came out. Um, what I need you to do is kind of just tell me, in your words, what's been going on so far today. Um, my wife got up at 5 this morning and went running. Um, and I stayed in bed. She, I woke up at 8, and she hadn't awakened me when she got home and showered and, and went to work at 7. At least I thought that's what had happened. Um, I normally, sometimes, most of the time I drive her to work, and she, she wakes me up when she's ready and I take her to work, but sometimes she drives. So, and today she was driving, so, um... Uh, sir, what are you saying? It's so obvious you're trying to cover your own ass. I drive her, but when I don't, she drives herself. Uh, duh. The detective asked what happened today. So far you said she went for a run, and you woke up at 8, and she didn't wake you. But then you also have these long explanations of her not waking you when she got home, or showered, or to drive her, and that she drives herself, so you wouldn't think that it was odd that she hadn't woken you by that time. Why are you trying to provide the officer with a reasonable explanation for why you wouldn't think anything was wrong? Most innocent people don't have the forethought to give the police a reason for why they wouldn't think anything was wrong. If anything, they would be doing the opposite, saying, Why didn't I realize when I wasn't woken up that something was wrong? and blaming themselves even though it wasn't their fault, and no rational person would think something was wrong at that point. Which is also why innocent people can sometimes seem guilty and should always get a lawyer. Especially if they feel guilt over the fact that something happened to someone they believe it was their job to protect. But with this dude, it's the opposite. It's like he's trying to convince the detective that he couldn't have possibly known if something was wrong, I think he's also looking for reassurance from the detective that his story is making sense. I love that the detective just doesn't say anything yet and allows the suspect to keep spewing information. Um, when I woke up and she was gone, I just figured she hadn't 
awaken me, just let me sleep. And so I got up at eight, did some things. I um, played my Nintendo a bit, and we needed a new mattress. We decided to get one, so I went. And we, and we had been shopping around, looking at different places, and I had found one. Wait, what, what time was that? Uh, I, I left my place at about nine. Um, I drove around. Most of the places were were uh, closed where I was looking, but they uh, one place said on the door that they were they would open at ten. But I got what there. What place was that? You know. I I, I can't remember the name. But it's it's right next to R.C. Willie. Okay. Um, One place had a sign. It said ten, but I was I was there at uh, probably a little after nine, and the door was open. I went in, and someone helped me. To which? What's it gonna say? Which R.C. Willie was this by? Twenty first South. One there on 300 West, or no? Yeah. 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 Could his alibi be any more vague? Uh, I did some things. We needed a mattress. I found one with a sign. I don't know the name. I mean, I don't expect people to have a minute by minute playbook, but having no details at all is a big red flag. I personally think too many details or too few details are the stories of liars. The good liars tend to give too many details and are quite good at distracting and redirecting to a question they actually are willing to answer. Bad liars give few details because they don't really know what they're doing or how to keep up with it. Mark had been lying to his family and Lori for a long time, but he also did not cover his tracks at all. If you look to the Chandler Holderson case, Chandler set up elaborate emails and forwarded those to his parents in order to trick them. It seems that Mark just told everyone he got accepted and they believed him because they didn't have a reason not to. These cases make no sense. Your lies are going to come out anyway. So to kill anyone to try and prevent lies from coming out or cover them up is absurd. The amount of delusion that these liars must live in is phenomenal. Okay, so you go in there because the door's open. And they had the mattresses we were looking at. They were sort of um, uh, extreme comfort or something like that. This is the same day! You don't remember the type of mattress you were buying when you guys were looking for a specific mattress as told by yourself by saying you guys were shopping around for specific ones? Yeah, no, I don't believe you for a second. And, uh, and it was a good deal. So How much did you pay for? I paid... $500, somewhere around there. And they had, um, we needed new pillows too. Our pillows were pretty shot. And I bought two pillows. And they were something like $49 a piece or $50 a piece or something. I don't know if he said that on accident but he shot Lori while she slept on their bed. Was that his subconscious slipping through and letting on to the truth? I'm just wondering because, of course, the pillows were shot means that they were old and tired and need to be thrown out in everyday vernacular. Do you guys think this was just part of his speech, or do you guys think it was his subconscious kind of slipping out a bit of the truth? Okay, do you want sheets or anything like that to go along with them? No. You didn't buy any sheets? No. How much did you say the pills were about? About 50 bucks. So I spent about $600 on the mattress and the pillows. About that. Okay. But you don't remember the name of the place? It's, 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 it's called something like, uh, 
it has something to do with sleeping comfortably or something like that. Like that's the title. I love it. The detective throws out a statement that is semi-accusatory, but not fully confrontational. Right now, I assume he is gauging how Mark will react when confronted. Mark seems to realize that it doesn't make sense that he wouldn't remember the name of a place he had spent so much money at, and comes up with this ridiculous generality of a name, sleeping comfortably. This shows that Mark will make up more lies when confronted, and honestly that's great for the detective. The more details Mark tries to give, the more he'll expose his own lies. Okay, so you buy the mattress. Did they deliver? Did you have to take it home, or yes. how did it work? Took it home. You took it home. In what kind of vehicle? Uh, uh, what time did you leave the store? Let's keep the timeline down here. Um, just nine nine thirty. So he wasn't there very long. It was really quick. No. So you took the mattress home in your car? On top of my car. On top of your car? Did you tie it down or anything? What did you tie it down with? Twine. Do you know where the twine's at now? Do you know how to it, it should be in my dumpster. Okay. Wine? I'm sorry, but what? This seems like the most rushed operation to get a mattress that I have ever seen. You drive around just desperately trying to find an open mattress store. You find one, but you don't remember the name, and you bought an extra comfort mattress and two pillows within 30 minutes, not including driving time, so it's even less than 30 minutes. Then you strap the mattress to the top of your car with twine? But don't worry, because at the start you mentioned how of course you and your wife had mutually decided you needed a better mattress, and had been looking for that exact one, so now it makes sense. No! This man is really dumb to think any of this is believable. Okay, what happened if you got the mattress on? I put it on my bed, I was putting sheets on, I called my wife while I was putting sheets on, and, and someone else answered the phone. About what time is this? About 10. Why are you calling her work phone first? Why wouldn't you try to call her cell phone first before you report her missing? And if that doesn't work, then you'd call her work phone and see if she's there or has come in at all. Or call her cell phone after... You called her work phone just to see if she blew all the day off or something. They called wife's cell phone? No. No. Her uh, work, work phone. phone. So it's really good for assuming that. Mm, what was the reason for the call? Just to say hi. Okay. Call us work, phone, someone else answered. Do you know who answered? His name is Brandon. Do you know him? My wife is training him. I had never met him. Okay. What did you... What happened during the phone call, the telephone call? I asked to talk to my wife. Well, I don't remember the exact words. Something he said, something along the lines is, "Is Lori okay?" And I Brandon said, "Asked you that?" Yeah, and I said, "I don't know." And then he told me she hadn't come in. So I went looking for her. Oh wow, he's moving so much in just this tiny little segment. I think because he's showing himself as the last person who saw her 
as obviously her manager had not, and it makes him extremely nervous since he knows he did it and knows this will cause more suspicion to be placed on him. He doesn't know what to do with his hands and he searches around the room for any cameras, making eye contact with the one we are watching. For someone whose wife is missing, he doesn't seem very distraught or upset, just extremely nervous. Okay, where did you, how did you know where to go look? Because she runs in the same place every day. She, she goes up there every single day? Um, no. Most of the time? Five or six days a week. Okay. Okay, about what time was it you left to go look for? Just after 10, just right away. So it was close to 10, 10, 15, 10, 10? Something like that, yeah. Okay. 10, I'll just say 10 to 10, 15, just guessing. Okay. I'll put a question mark so we're not being helped at. Look, he's getting so uncomfortable with this portion in particular. He doesn't really want to dwell on times or put a concrete time down because that could possibly be refuted by someone and then they'd have something to confront him with. So he just agrees quickly to the guesstimates and ends the discussion. Did you see what she was wearing? You're probably given that information. You didn't. Okay. Any assumption? Does she have like shorts she wears all the time? Does she have different ones? Or different ones. Different ones each day, huh? Doesn't want to get stinky. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So you went looking up there. When did you decide to call the police? Right away. Right. I tried before I left the apartment, but it was busy. So I grabbed my you phone book. What number did you get dialed? Do you know? Dispatch. I don't know. The phone was busy, or did it have a recording, or what it was, was it? Busy. Like B, B, B. You don't remember what number it was you called? No, but I called the same one from my car. Okay. What, how long was it when you called back again? In your car. Just a matter of minutes, three minutes. And, and you got in okay? Okay. So you called before you even got up there to look for? Okay, what happened when you got up to Memory Grove? Did you get up there before the police, or about, about how long did it take you to drive up there? Like 10 minutes. So now we're around about 10.30, Probably. say. Did you find her car? Mm-hmm. Does she park it in the same place when she goes jogging up there, or? On the I, 
I haven't been up there. I don't know where it's at or anything. There's not. It's just on the street. Just is it on the road that goes around, or is it up the canyon? Down, and, down in Memory Grove. Down at the bottom by the gate and all that. Okay. And that's just where you found that she, you're not sure that's where she always parks it or anything. She parks it on that road every time. Every time. I'm just. You, you say the same place. It's on the road. I mean, general. Right. Not the same okay. parking spot. Nobody can get there. Right. Did the cops arrive shortly after you, or were they already there? No, or? they told me they couldn't look for her for 24 hours. That's what they told you on the phone? Okay. So how did you finally get them up there? Other people called. Other people called? Do you know who? No. So other people called, and then they said they'd go up there? People she works with, co-workers, okay. but I don't know who. Did you call them and tell them that that's what they had told you or anything? Her worker, fellow workers, or did they all just start calling in on their own? They. When I got to Memory Grove this morning, they knew what was going on because I'd been on the phone with them and I told them okay. what was going out there and they just showed up. All right. of our friends? Yeah. Okay. Our friends were at Memory Grove. Do you know how many of them called in? Called the police? Yeah. I don't know. I was up searching when they called and said, the police are here now. They called you on your cell phone and told you? Do you know about what time the cops arrived up there? No mm, idea. 11. Okay. You say the cops arrived at 11, but earlier the detective asked if the cops arrived shortly after, and you said no? Even though you agreed, you got to Memory Grove around 10.30. 11 is pretty shortly after 10.30 in my opinion. Liars just have to lie, I guess. And between that time, you had been up looking in the, the shrubs and all that. Okay. about the, the twist of it right there. Um, okay, I just want to point out how visibly agitated he is here. Like, he's really making this seem like it's a burden for him, and it's super strange behavioral display from someone who thinks their pregnant wife is missing and wants to find her. Okay. 
I just had to get a basis for the questions. Okay, let me explain the, the test to you. So you understand it so you feel comfortable with it and so you won't be afraid of it. Okay. Um, what this is is a truth verification machine. Okay. Have you seen movie? Have you ever had a lie detector test, the old-fashioned type? If you've seen them on TV, okay, they have like the, the box and they have all the arms going around, the papers rolling, the guy's sitting in the chair and he's all strapped up and all that stuff. Okay, that was developed in the 1930s. Okay, we're hoping technology has advanced a little more since then, mm -hmm. and that's what this is. Okay, before we get going, we need to take care of some items of business here. How do you spell your last name? H-A-C-K-I-N-G. waiver form. It's basically saying you're taking this of your own free will. Nobody's forcing you or coercing you or anything of that nature. Okay. Okay, you can agree with that. If you can agree with that, just sign that there. Ooh. Okay. Did you see how quickly he pushed that paper away from him? He was like, oh, hell no, get that shit away from me. This test will prove I'm lying and I'm not willing for that to happen. He's not going to take that. No way. No how. I, I do feel coerced into taking this. And how do you feel? I mean, let, let me explain this to you. Nobody's making you take this test. If you don't want to, you can walk right out that door. Right and now. what happens to me? You walk out the door and they take you back up to your car. Miz must have thought he was going to get arrested on the spot if he didn't take that. Newsflash, they can't even use those results in court anyways, but they can use them against you in interrogation and tell you you failed them and then use that in order to get you to confess like they did to Chris Watts. Okay. And if I refuse, then of course that makes me look guilty. It's not admissible in court anyway. So what are you doing? Just gives us... We trust the machine, the courts just don't. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It just gives us something to verify the information that we've got so far. And obviously, as you, as you said, obviously, we, we, we got some concerns about this mattress thing. Okay? Obviously, some concerns are going to come up about that, and we just want to get them clarified. Because we interview... People that have killed people all the time, and they don't tell us the truth. That's why we have this machine. You see, you see where we're coming from? I if do. somebody's killed somebody, they're not going to come out and tell us, yeah, I killed them. And that's what this machine is just for. But at the same time, I've got these circumstances that look bad. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like... And then I asked him, I said, after the lie detector test, <clears throat> and I pass it, can we be done with everything? And he said, yes. So mm -hmm. I feel like if I don't take this, then I'm just going to be drilled. Well, here's the other thing. If, if you've got nothing to worry about, if you haven't done anything, you have nothing to worry about, even if they do go through that evidence. Do you know what I'm saying? You have nothing to lose by this. Unless you're guilty, which he is, don't you just love how he said, I have circumstances that make me look bad, and then just had no resolution to that statement. This man is quite obviously guilty, and only planned on taking the test to try and beat it. It seems that he doesn't believe he can beat it anymore, and doesn't want to go through with it now. I don't think I want to take it. Okay. And nobody's going to force you to. Okay. Let me 
me just come on here. So thank you just a minute. Mark would later reveal to his brothers the real truth about the disappearance of Lori, that Mark had shot her in her sleep and placed her body in a dumpster. This, along with blood left on the headboard and in Lori's car, were enough to arrest Mark on August 2nd. Lori's remains were discovered in a landfill on October 1st, 2004. After getting a deal, Mark pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced six years to life in April of 2005. A judge would later say Mark would have to spend at least 30 years in prison before being eligible for parole. Lori's law was then created, raising the minimum sentence of first-degree murder in Utah from 6 years to 15 years. And for the reason why he killed Lori? She wanted a divorce. Because he had been lying to her. He told her that they were going to move to North Carolina because he had gotten accepted to medical school at UNC Chapel Hill. And he had never even applied. Lori had called and found out that he had never applied and never been accepted. And then she found out that not only had he not applied or been accepted to UNC Chapel Hill, he had also dropped out of the University of Utah where he lived and had never actually graduated there from that. So Lori, being the independent strong woman she was, decided that after he broke her trust, that she was going to get out of the situation. He had lied to her about their entire future. And so she was going to get out. And rather than going through a divorce, Mark decided to kill her. It's honestly disgusting. He says that it haunts him, but he was selling autographs and stuff out of his jail cell for about a year. So I don't really feel like he's that remorseful. Let me know what you guys think. A huge shout out to our Patreon producers, Jason and Taz, and Skylar James Wicker. All the support really helps the channel, and I appreciate all that you patrons do. Thank you so much. Like and subscribe for more interrogation breakdown and true crime videos to come. If you have a suggestion, leave it in the comments below. Thanks and have a wonderful day.